So again, uh, good afternoon to the guest of honor, the faculties of CPMB TNEU, the students of CPMB uh, TNEU as well as LLB school and my fellow members. I, Dr. Mahesh Veliswami, a member from LLB school and a fellow alumni of CPMB TNEU. Today, I'm very delighted to host my old friend and also alumni of CPMB TNEU, Dr. Aditi Varadarajan. Um, uh, who is currently working as a senior postdoctoral fellow uh, from Munich, German. And to know more about her, now I request Professor Nyanam, head of mathematics CPMB TNAU, to give brief keynote about her. So please, ma'am. Uh, Thanks, Mahesh. Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Aditi a senior postdoctoral fellow, Fraunhofer Institute of uh, Toxicology and Experimental Medicine, Munich, Germany. Uh, you know, she is going to talk about an integrative model system to gain mechanistic insights into genotype, proteotype, phenotypic relations. She is one of our proud alumni, completed her BTEC bioinformatics during 2011. And during her undergraduate, she had her internship at Indian Institute of Science by avail availing the Summer Research Fellowship Program through JNC ASR. And even during that time, she had published a paper in a high impact journal, Applied and Translational Genomics from her uh, internship research. Later, she moved to International Rice Research Institute, Philippines, and she stayed there uh, for, uh, to, from 2011 to 13. And she worked as an SRF and she carried out the in silico QTL mapping with special reference to drought tolerance in, in the rice. Her MSc bioinformatics, she has completed from Wageningen University and Research from 2013 to 15. She worked on building and comparing gene regulatory network on model species like Arabidopsis and rice. And uh, during her MSc, she has availed two prestigious fellowships, which has covered her both tuition fee as well as the living expenses. She was awarded Wageningen University Fellowship Program, which was supposed to be given only to top 1% of the student, which had covered her tuition fee. And later, she was awarded Anyone Then Ban Funds, which is again given to only top 0.1% of the student meritoriously, uh, which covered her living expenses. So in that way, you know, she had completed her MSc without uh, a single penny from her side. Uh, she had carried out her internship during her MSc at Agroscope, which is a Swiss Center of Excellence for Agriculture Research. And uh, she has done NGS analysis and DNO assembly in 10 pseudomonas species, uh, which she had collected from infected potato, uh, which is uh, having a resistance against Phytophthora infestans. And her ultimate aim was to develop a novel biocontrol agent. And uh, through her uh, internship program, she has published three journals, uh, three, three papers in a very high impact journal. And uh, later, for her doctoral degree, she has joined in EDH Jurich. Uh, you must be knowing that uh, that is one of the leading university in science and technology. Uh, the global rank is uh, six, and it is having around 19,000 students and 2,600 staff members. And so she had uh, done integrative proteogenomics, mainly to identify the entire protein coding potential in the prokaryote. Um, and that she has uh, produced uh, nine uh, papers. Uh, out of uh, nine, um, five, she is the first author. And currently, she is a postgraduate scientist from 2019 onwards. Uh, to mention briefly, she is having seven years of experience um, the data science, and besides, she's also good at NGS data analysis and structural bioinformatics. She worked in institutions across four countries in Asia and uh, Europe. So my, uh, up to now, she has published almost uh, 12 publications which are having very good impact factor. With this small introduction, uh, I request Aditi to initiate her talk. Yeah. Uh, so welcome everyone. Good morning to the people in Europe or good, good afternoon to the people in India. I thank you very much, Nano Ma'am, uh, LNP School, CPMB, TNAU, for providing me this opportunity. I'm really honored to be here today to present this webinar. 
And uh, I, of course, want to start my presentation right away. It's the topic would be an integrative model system to gain mechanistic insight into genotype, proteotype, phenotype relationships. And I hope at the end of this presentation, I justify how bioinformatics can be used together to uh, do a multi-omic data analysis and link the genotype to the phenotype of an organism. So this is one of the sub project during my PhD. And my PhD was mostly focused on next generation proteogenomic strategy. And together, the proteogenomics word itself, it just combines this aspect of proteomics along with genomics with this hidden element of transcriptomics. What we do is a multi-omic data analysis, and I developed this kind of a pipeline, which is combining already published tools and softwares, and create this integrated model system so that we can combine different kinds of omics data analysis. And the ultimate aim of this uh, project was to identify the entire protein coding potential in prokaryotic genomes, that is to identify all protein coding genes in a bacterial organism. And thereby, we wanted to link the genotype to the phenotype of an organism. Now, I applied it for several different bacterial models, which includes, of course, microbiome, host microbiome interaction, uh, interaction specific model organism, antibiotic resistance model organism, clinical isolate like Listeria monocytogenes, which I would be focusing today during my presentation, and last, of course, not least, agricultural and food relevant microorganism. So I have been doing research both in plant-associated microbiomes and of course also health science. And my aim was to develop this methodology that can be widely applicable to any kind, any sort of bacterial model organism. So briefly today, the whole presentation will be on this organism called the stadium monocytogenes. And it is about a proteogenomic resource which can link the genotype to the phenotype. All these particular projects have been published already. And you can find the information either in my ORCID or in my LinkedIn. So let me dive deep into the topic now. The stereo monocytogenes, what, what is it as an organism? It's an opportunity foodborne pathogen, and it causes this disease called listeriosis. Listeriosis is the third most common foodborne disease, and an infection with listeria monocytogenes usually happens when you eat like contaminated food. And by contaminated food, it can be either contaminated raw vegetables or can be contaminated cooked food. But mostly for a healthy person, that is if you have, if you're perfectly healthy, it usually doesn't cause much big of a problem. It leads to just, let's say some diarrhea and you suffer from light fever. And sometimes you also cannot even show any symptoms. But it is different for people who have, let's say, an immune deficiency, who are low in immunity. It can be affecting kids also, and also specifically, it's a fatal for pregnant women. What usually happens in these immunocompromised patients is that they, it can lead to like meningitis or sepsis, which is actually like a, a blood-related uh, uh, symptoms, and also some leading to pneumonia where you have troubles breathing. And if such an immunocompromised patient is actually affect, infected with hysteria, then it can lead up to a 20% mortality, which is pretty high for such bacterial associated diseases. And typically, the most important reason why hysteria is being studied is because it causes abortion in pregnant women. That is, it's so dangerous that it can, tran it can go from your human mother body through the placenta to the child, the neonate that is being de developing inside the womb and then kill such a neonate. Therefore, it's, a, it's an organism that is like quite relevant in the studies right now, and especially for contaminated food, because we have changed our production of food system, we have changed how we store and how we cook food. And you might have often heard that that's why there is like pregnant women are especially asked not to eat any kind of raw food, whether it's starting from raw vegetables or the raw meat, for example. Now, the stereo, it's separated into 14 different serotypes. Serotypes are similar to strains, and there is only three major serotypes that causes 96% of mysteriosis cases. And these serotypes are classified as half A, half B, and 4B, and these are the common three most uh, serotypes that are uh, researchers' interest or researchers' target. The, the thing about this listeria is that when we started this study as a group that was in like around 2017, there was no comprehensive quantitative prototype. And by that, what I mean, there was no qu comprehensive quantitative protein information available for this particular organism. Therefore, it was difficult to see how what's kind of an expression when it's actually infecting or uh, during a normal or a control condition. And the interest was to generate this kind of quantitative prototype. 
And then I was actually also interested in like basically combining this prote proteomics information along with let's say genomics and transcriptomics and to see if I can provide first to generate few hypotheses on few protein candidates that might be interesting to study and also to see if we can pinpoint specifically how the genome of this organism is related to its function or to its phenotype. Therefore, we, the objectives that we set for this project was to, gen, uh, to uh, generate a comprehensive quantitative proteotype for these for two key listeria model organisms. One is the strain called EGDE, which is a half a serotype, and another is a strain called Scotty. Now, the difference between these two strains or serotypes is that EGDE was mostly uh, obtained from contaminated food. So when you sample a contaminated food, we always found that the strain that was mostly present there was EGDE. However, when we sample like immunocompromised patients or patients who are infected with listeriosis, we usually find SCOTA in their genome. And the question was, both were equally infective or were present in the contaminated food and also in the listeriosis patients, but only SCOTA was usually recovered from the patient sample itself. So there must be a difference between why EGD is present in food but is not able to infect a human system, where SCOTA is present in the food and is able to infect a human system. So therefore, we use these two as the model system for us to uh, understand the listeria biology. Therefore, uh, we created this, we wanted to create this model system where we can integrate the different OBINGS data set and be potentially able to link the unique genomic regions, that is the genome, unique parts of the EGDE and SCOTA to its differential protein expression data, and ultimately to see if we can understand how this cells Cope with, uh, their pass cope with their infection system and their passage through the gastrointestinal tract. And the gastrointestinal tract system, this is very interesting because usually not a lot of bacteria survive in our, uh, in our harsh gastrointestinal tract system that is in the stomach and in the small intestine and large intestine because uh, we do have like a low pH, high pH conditions and therefore also some harsh uh, solutions like bile salts, et cetera where the bacteria should generally not survive, but listeria is able to survive in that system. Therefore, that was our phenotypic, uh, phenotypic uh, point of interest why we wanted to study listeria also. So further, uh, this is like a one slide content for me where I'm like showing like a graphical abstract what we achieved in this particular project. And this uh, very briefly, I'll, I'll actually walk you through it step by step through the different parts of this, uh, this uh, analysis. But briefly, what we did is we combined the different proteomic system along with genotypic information, comparative genomic analysis, putting them together into a system of proteogenomics and ultimately trying to link the genotype to the phenotype. Let me start with what we did with the genotype analysis. So what we noticed is that EGDE strain itself did not have a de novo assembled genome. By de novo assembled genome, I mean like a fully complete uh, chromosome available for this bacteria. So what happened uh, is that like when we looked into the NCBI reference, EGDE had a very good reference genome, but it did not, uh, the chromosome was complete, but it was not exactly the lab strain that we had in our hand. And for SCOTA, the problem was a bit more different. There was a reference genome available in NCBI, but it was fragmented into five contents. Now for a bacterial model system, it usually has one chromosome. And we had this advanced NGS technology. So our point was like, why, why do we not have a fully assembled complete chromosome? Because if you have a fragmented conti, we will not be able to understand few of the proteins or the genes that are missing in this fragmented context. Therefore, we thought, okay, now we are going to see resequence both the organisms. It will be exactly the strain where we are generating other omics data analysis and try to obtain a full complete chromosome of these two strains. So we started with like uh, sequencing these two strains with uh, third generation and second generation sequencing technology, which included uh, PacBio and Illumina and Nanopore based technology. And we did a hybrid assembly there. And by hybrid assembly, I mean like we combine the reads from all these different techniques and put them together to obtain this genome assembly genome. There are a few advantages and disadvantages of comparing this back bio versus Illumina versus Nanopore, but without going too much into depth, there is always this trade-off between how long a read you get versus how many errors you have in a particular read. Therefore, combining these three technologies provided a provided us not only long reads, but also a low error rate content on these particular reads. Therefore, together I combined them and I did a hybrid assembly. 
and I obtained a full chromosome. What you see here in the two figures is the full, as fully assembled de novo chromosome of these two strains. On the, on the outside here line, you have these chromosome for EGDE and here respectively for SCOTA. And there are like in the inner circles, you have some features, but also comparison of this uh, de novo assembled chromosome against its reference genome that was already present in the NCBI. We wanted to make sure during this comparison that the chromosome that we obtain is high quality, it does not have any error, and it does not have any mistakes that we might have made during this de novo assembly process. Together, both these genomes were approximately three megabase pairs, nothing compared to a big plant genome, but it was like really small genome, therefore we could successfully obtain a full chromosome. And they encoded like approximately 3,000 genes with a GC percentage of approximately 38 and a very good coverage both at the Illumina and the PacBio level. Now, one thing I want to point out in this slide is this particular uh, uh, Scott A strain on the right side panel. Here we have the chromosome and the fragmented reference content mapped against the chromosome. And we obtained that there were like quite, quite many missing, uh, missing genes in the system, which was approximately like 14 genes that were missing and also a 12 kilobase pair of missing genomic sequence. Apart from that, we, of course, obtained a lot of single nucleotide polymorphism, like 29 SNPs and indels in the case of EGD, and more, more than 100 uh, SNPs and indels in the case of Scotty. Now, once we had established this, the aim was to, okay, now we have a fully, uh, fully assembled genome. We can have, uh, use it as a perfect reference point where we can start integrating the other proteomic data sets or other transcriptomics data sets. So we had this knowledge now, and then we proceeded next to do one more comparison. That comparison was to do a, a compare the two strains, that is EGDE versus the SCOTA. Now, why we wanted to do this was, of course, we wanted to understand, are there any geno at the genomic level, are there any differences between these two organisms? Not by their chromosome level difference, that is not only if they are different in their chromosome, but also to understand if some of the protein coding genes and the genes itself, are they, how much are they different? Are they like completely similar? So we did this comparative genomic analysis with like some, there are like several uh, published tools available out there. And I put them together into a pipeline to see that if I can compare these two strengths. Together, what I obtained is that there were approximately 2,648 core clusters, that is clusters of genes that are completely identical, or at least I wouldn't call completely identical, they were homologous between these two strains, between EGD and SCOTA. And then we had this uh, a few, few of the unique genes that were specific to only one strain, that is EGD versus SCOTA. Now, okay, we do also understand at the genomic level that, okay, there are differences, there are commonalities between these two strains, but we of course want to reach next to the function of this particular organism. Now, in order to do that function, we chose on the proteomic data set, but we also uh, had some transcriptomics uh, data set that was publicly available, but we did not use it in this system because we had like very, uh, very good proteomic data available across different conditions. But one could use it because this particular genome is now uh, publicly available and there is annotation information, so one could use the transcriptomics data too. So for the proteomics data analysis, what we did is like we had to decide on what conditions and what uh, cultures are we going to use. And the idea was that we wanted to mimic the bacteria in the, in the culture condition, mimic the bacteria as it is actually infecting the human gut uh, microbiome uh, gut system, that is the gastrointestinal system. Therefore, what we did uh, here is that we exactly replicated the culture condition that could uh, resemble the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And we used like a single tube processing protocol, that is by single tube, just process the whole protein sample into a single ependroph. And the reason that you do is usually in proteomics, you process the proteins step by step. And there is a possibility that you have a lot of technical variation during this process. And also you, there's a possibility that you lose a lot of proteins during this tran manual transfer steps. Therefore, we wanted to make sure that, okay, we are not going to do that. We'll try to establish a single to processing protocol where we do all the processing starting from extraction of the proteins up to digestion of the proteins into peptides before loading it, loading it into a mass spectrometer. And this was a, this was a pretty robust uh, preparation workflow. And it included, of course, some treatment strategies, some digestion uh, differences compared to a standard workflow. And in the end, we obtained quite some, uh, quite some amount of protein, which could be shot into a mass spectrometer. 
And in terms of condition, what we did is like we replicated this gastrointestinal tract. So for example, stomach has usually a low pH condition. So we included like in the media, some, uh, some chemicals that can actually reduce the pH and then correspondingly the bile salt, which was reflecting the duodenum of the, of the gastrointestinal tract. And finally, the jejunum of the small intestine also, which is, has a condition of high osmolarity. So this was closely replicating then the GI tract, and we hoped that when the proteins are expressing in these condition, that will mimic at least as close as possible what happens in the actual in vivo conditions here. So once we had these all these proteins extracted, we put them, shot them into a mass spectrometer, which was from a thermo scientific, and then we uh, did a data dependent acquisition mass spectrometer. I don't have time to go into the details of how the data dependent acquisition works, but very briefly, what happens is you have the proteins, you shoot them into mass spectrometer, uh, you have the proteins digested into peptides, you shoot them into mass spectrometer, and based upon the mass to charge ratio, you obtain the spectra in the end. And you try to analyze the spectra against your protein database, which is usually a FASTA database, and you try to see what are the proteins that are present in these particular conditions. Also, you try to build like kind of uh, in the proteomics world, it is called like a spectral library. And by the spectral library, you also try to note all the spectra that is obtained for your proteins, and you can use them for subsequent uh, protein quantification experiment. So in this case, we did a DDA-MS data, and then we used uh, the ncbi rep uh, annotation. So what I usually do is when I have a fully assembled genome, I submit it to NCBI and then I obtained from them, uh, from their prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline, the high quality annotation and combine it, it with my own ab, ab initio and in silico annotation in order to obtain a full blown annotation database. And then we use it uh, for searching the proteomics data. Now, in this, in this particular case, we obtained, like, together combining all conditions, we obtained close to 70% of the proteome covered in our experiment. Now, 70% of the proteome I mean, like, you had, we had approximately 3,000 uh, uh, protein coding genes in this organism, and we obtained, like, approximately 2,000 here, like, 2,042 or so, uh, that is 70% of the protein coverage. This is usually a very high coverage because in the proteomics experiment, you also have this problem of uh, a lot of technical variations and biological variations leads to the fact that you don't obtain like maximum 50 to 60 percent of the protein coverage. But in this case, with the single tube processing, we obtained like uh, 70 percent of the protein coverage. And the next thing we did was, of course, like once we had this uh, identification of the proteins, we further wanting, wanted to quantify these proteins in the different conditions. That is, obtain what is the protein quantity here. For this, we followed like uh, one is called a DIA, uh, DIA, sorry, a DIA MS data, which is like a data independent acquisition. And for the data independent acquisition, what you do is, is that you obtain a lot of different spectra and try to quantify the proteins based upon their spectral counts and based upon the area under the curve. And here, for doing a data independent acquisition, you have you create a spectral library, which is similar to a FASTA database, but it has much more information using the data dependent acquisition proteomics data. So then we had the spectral library created using the previous data processing. And there for each EGD and SCOT A, we obtained close to 2000 proteins included in the spectral library. Then it, it also included approximately 15 uh, to 17% of the proteins that was proteotypic, uh, that is proteotypic, meaning proteins that was present only in one or versus the other strain, that is only in EGD versus SCOT A or SCOT A versus EGD. And this was, of course, of, for us, it would be interesting from the point of view of a phenotype. Therefore, we also tried to see how many such uh, uh, proteotypic proteins are present in our spectral library. And together, what we saw is that, okay, we, our spectral library was already covering 2,000 proteins, therefore we can proceed ahead with our quantification analysis. And one point before, what we wanted to do an analysis here is do a gene ontology uh, enrichment analysis. By gene ontology enrichment analysis, I am trying to find what kind of uh, biological process, molecular function, and cellular component are enriched in my spectral library compared to the total proteins that are, that are actually encoded in an organism. 
And this particular analysis is being done just for, uh, for us to have an idea that what kind of proteins are included in the spectral library and what can I expect, which proteins might be missing in my ultimate DIA-based analysis, that is in my protein quantification. And what one thing that I want to just point out here uh, in the slide is not just four panels here, but there's two panels here, is that we noticed that proteins that are actually localized to the transmembrane region of this bacteria was underrepresented in our uh, spectral library. That is, proteins which were in, localized to cytoplasm were overrepresented in this uh, spectral library. So we knew that, okay, the transmembrane proteins, we could not identify them in our proteomics analysis. Therefore, we cannot expect those proteins to be quantified also ultimately. This information would be important because then we know what kind of proteins to hunt uh, afterwards in our uh, in-depth analysis. So we did this and then uh, together, then we obtained like uh, with the, with the DDA-based uh, identification and with the DIA-based quantification, together we obtained approximately 1,700 to 1,800 proteins quantified at the, uh, at the proteotypic level. And uh, so then we wanted to say, okay, now we have the proteins identified, we had the proteins that were quantified. Now the interest would be to see how do these uh, proteins differ between the different conditions and differ between the two strains that we were wanted, wanting to study. Therefore, I did here a differential expression analysis. But differential expression analysis means you just compare the quantities of these proteins across different conditions. Let's say you take the control condition and the low pH condition and you compare these proteins, followed by some level of statistical analysis, and you try to see are there proteins that are overexpressed or underexpressed in one condition versus other? So uh, here on the on the plot, what I'm showing it's a volcano plot, and the volcano plot usually compares uh, shows the differential expression uh, analysis output from comparing the two conditions. So here on the left panel, I have bile salts and control. That is, bile salts is a condition replicating the jejunum and control was the normal like LB medium at 37 degrees Celsius, that is a room temperature. And on the right, I have low pH compared to the control. And in the plot, what you see, the gray dots here are those proteins that are not differentially expressed. That is, their quantities are similar between the two conditions that you compare. And on the red, you have here the uh, proteins that are uh, highly uh, expressed, that are expressed higher in one condition versus other. And on the blue dots, you have those that are uh, expressed low in one condition versus the other. And in this case, this is by salts versus control, for example. So the observation, first observations that we have based upon the differential expression analysis is that very few proteins were differentially expressed in high osmolarity condition versus control. So out of the three conditions, when we compare to control, one had hardly any proteins that were differentially expressed. That means in the high osmo osmolarity conditions, the similar kind of proteins are expressed when you compare it to control. And uh, when we do the similar analysis for low pH versus control, we had quite some proteins, like few proteins um, that were uh, differentially expressed, whereas for bile salts, there were like a lot of proteins that were differentially expressed. So we are quite uh, interested what is happening in the jejunum of our gastrointestinal tract. Why is the bacteria having some more, some additional proteins or some different proteins that is expression, uh, which it is expressing when it is compared to a control condition? And there must be something happening uh, for, the, for the bacteria during this survival process. And what we also noticed is that most of these differentially expressed proteins were involved when we try to see the function or the gene ontology classification, or also its domain, for example, we see that most of these proteins were involved in the fitness or in the virulence cell division, pepto peptidoglycan synthesis, for example. And what does that mean is all these biological processes are usually involved when a bacteria is, is stressed with a particular condition where it is, it has to survive while it has to also keep multiplying. So some of these proteins in the biological process were highly expressed and it was quite interesting. Then when we looked into the list of proteins, it was like more than, we had I think more than like 200 proteins that were differentially expressed in bile salts versus control. And we noticed one, this highly expressed protein, highly differentially regulated protein, which was a flagellin. And what a flagellin is, flagellin is basically a structural component of a flagella. 
And flagella, you can imagine these are like tentacle-like structures which are uh, present on the cell wall of a bacteria, and it allows this bacteria to swim in any kind of media or condition. And in the in our in the in vivo condition in the gastrointestinal fluids that it is encountering. So we thought, okay, there must be some reason why flagella is highly expressed here. Therefore, we also first wanted to, from the technical standpoint of view, we wanted to verify, is it really true? We did like a targeted proteomics experiment where you specifically target only the list of proteins where you are interested in, which included also flagella here for us and many other proteins, but uh, I'll talk only about flagella here for you uh, today, just as an example. And so that yes, flagella was highly expressed in the, in the bile salt condition versus the control. So then uh, we followed it with like a specific, uh, specific targeted uh, proteomics. In the targeted proteomics, we observed that yes, the bile, in the bile salt condition, uh, the protein was uh, relatively highly abundant, like uh, almost like three to four folds uh, high abundant. And uh, also similar was, was for both the strains, that is both for EGD and scotting. So then the one question that we had is, is the protein expressed at the protein level or is it already uh, at the transcript level, is it already expression, uh, its expression is high when you compare the two conditions. So we selected few time point courses between the control and the bile salts, and then we tried to do a qPCR analysis on this particular protein. And in the qPCR analysis, which you can see here in the right panel, is that in the qPCR analysis, the transcripts were not uh, differentially expressed. That is, the transcript almost stayed constant between the different time points and between the two conditions. Whereas on the protein level, they were like highly differentially expressed, starting from zero to uh, 15 minutes in the time point and 30 and 45, it uh, constantly kept increasing the flagellin protein. And this increase was high, uh, well, it, you, you can see in the graph, it kind of is high in the case of EGDE, but when, when I see the y-axis, we I can see that in the SCOT-A, it was very aggressive. That is, even at the 15 minutes time, the, num the number of flagellin proteins that were present or expressed was pretty, uh, was almost double the amount, and then uh, the 30 minutes, it increased further. So, uh, so we established that, okay, at the transcript level, it is not. So there is no, there's some post-transcriptional regulation that is happening to this protein where it is not actually differentially expressed at the transcript level, but at the protein level. So uh, we did also then some scanning electron microscopy experiment. And there we wanted to see uh, what's happening at this, uh, uh, for this protein in these conditions. One interesting point about the flagella is that uh, usually in the literature it was known that flagella is not expressed at 37 degrees Celsius, that is at room temperature. And for us, we were curious because our media condition was also at 37 degrees Celsius, but we had this additional bile salts into the media. So our question was, okay, why is it expressed at this 37 degrees Celsius when it is commonly known in the literature that it is actually should not be expressed? So we took a positive control at 20 degrees and we saw here, uh, I, I hope you can, you can see it. What we saw here is that these are these flagella-like web-like structures, uh, which were present in the 20 degrees that was confirming what is already known about this protein. And in the 37 degrees, we did not see any flagella at all, which is also already uh, known in the literature or in the scientific community. But when the, under the 37 degrees Celsius, when you expose the bacteria to the bile salts that is actually replicating the jejunum, small intestine part, then there were like a lot of these flagella structures. And the speculation was that, that okay, hysteria at 37 degrees Celsius, when it exposed to the uh, bile salt condition, then these flagella are instantly expressed. And the hypothesis could be, which is further being studied by my uh, by the experimentalists uh, who are collaborating with me, is that maybe there is this flagella that is uh, helping these bacteria to be motile, to be swimming along in this uh, solution, and therefore it is able to survive through the gastrointestinal tract and reach even the placenta and even cross the placenta kind of or uh, uh, in the placenta conditions and reach the neonate. Uh, together, apart from flagellin, we also had some more toxin antitoxin systems. We had we also found some type six secretion systems, which were pretty interesting and also is known for the bacteria to to uh, to express these proteins when it is actually exposed to such stress factors 
and uh, therefore together we uh, we kind of like are now exploring uh, further like the group is exploring further to see what can be derived in terms of the function of these two different strings and uh, compare it to the genomic level so with that i'm actually coming to the conclusion slide of this particular project what we here did is what I wanted to show you is a detailed bioinformatics analysis where we have the genome, we sequenced, we had the de novo sequenced assembly, we put it together with the proteomics information. I did not show there's also a bit of transcriptomic data analysis where we tried to see if uh, what are type, what are the proteins that are expressed at the protein level and uh, but are not expressed at the transcript level and vice versa to see if we can boil down the candidates from 3000 CDS to few CDS that are interesting uh, for this function. And uh, we did like all these kind of bioinformatics analysis is putting together this multi-omics uh, data sets and together build it into a model system where we can bridge this genome, uh, which bridge the gap between genome-wide and reductionist approaches to study uh, the role of uh, biofilms, the role of listeria in the antimicrobial uh, resistant environment and in the gastrointestinal tract. And also uh, we wanted to show that Together, my, my personal interest here was that I can create such an integrated model system and show that we can reproducibly integrate any kind of listeria data set. And by reproducibly integrate is that I release all the data sets to the public uh, community, to the research community. I release all my pipelines and tools through the, through the publication. And people can therefore uh, use these data set, use the knowledge that is available. And if they have a question about the listeria biology where they are studying EGD and SCOTA, for example, then they can use these uh, published data set to do further analysis to dive deep into the function of the organism. And uh, what I clearly realized also in several other projects that I did during each of the projects that I did during my PhD is that having a completely assembled uh, de novo genome for any kind of bacteria or any kind of system is the best possible starting point because then you have like a really good chromosome information where you can integrate the subsequent functional information. And um, ultimately what I did is that all the fully assembled genome the in-depth annotations, the prote proteomics expression, and all the spectral library information is now available as a community resource. Also, uh, I have, I'm, I, along with my PhD, I did like develop this website where I could release all these kind of different information, but also in the NCBI, you can find like commonly uh, found resources so that the research community can use it very uh, frequently. And also it's very helpful for anyone. So a similar system uh, was what I used for all of my different uh, uh, bacterial model systems, always trying to uh, go from the genomic to the proteomics level. I had this absolute uh, access to next generation sequencing facility to this amazing group of people who were doing always the proteomics experiments for me. And I was always be able to like obtain this nice data sets to do integrated multi-omic data analysis. Can find uh, you can uh, if you're curious you can always uh, ask me questions of course but also find in my publications how this was done and ultimately i just want you to leave uh, leave this presentation with just one message what i have learned through these years of bioinformatics experience it was not how cool bioinformatics is but the end information was how cool bioinformatics is that it is able to integrate these different data sets, different uh, in the world of now, we are in the world of data technology. We can integrate this amazing data set, create hypotheses, dive from uh, genome to the function of an organism and do amazing biology behind it. And I had like five lessons that I really learned from the bioinformatics. That was automation, literacy, transparent and accessible, versioning and reproducibility. So these are one ones of bioinformatics that I felt like helped me always in these years of uh, research. That is automation. It, it is basically having to write a code which is easily executable in any command line uh, software or any, any, by anyone in command line. Have always, uh, we always have to make sure that we have well annotated and documented code and it is transparent and accessible. Make our code as open source as possible because there's like research community always active and trying to contribute to your development and make sure that you always track your changes and updates of the different bioinformatics software and code using like softwares like GitHub. And one last important thing that I learned very, uh, very importantly is that having a reproducible uh, pipeline, a rep reproducible uh, workflow because it is always useful to, for anyone to read on such a software code and reproduce those results exactly 
so that it is uh, very easy for somebody to follow up afterwards and uh, do uh, continue in the research field and not have an endpoint thing. So uh, yeah, I thank you very much for your attention. Definitely, thank you uh, also CTM for providing me this. I have to thank my group of uh, people. Uh, and at Agroscope, who were behind this uh, amazing uh, uh, amount of work and my PhD and all the different publications. And uh, of course, thank you uh, for every audience who is uh, today attending this uh, seminar. I'm, I would be glad to take any questions now. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Aditi. I would say it's a wonderful and very uh, informative uh, slides. So with your permission, now uh, I would like to take a questions. Uh, yeah. Yes, Aditi, you can go ahead. Uh, so yeah, the, I'll repeat. The first question was, did you do any phylogenetic analysis between the two strains to other uh, organism? What is the co closest organism to the species? Uh, yes, so I did phylogenetic analysis between these uh, for these two strains in particular with uh, the whole of Listeria species, but also to the whole of uh, uh, alpha proteobacteria because uh, Listeria is alpha proteobacteria here. Uh, yes, and after, so two things. Before doing the phylogenetic analysis, I actually knew exactly which two strains I'm going to study, that is EGD and Scotty. And Listeria monocytogenous is the, uh, Listeria is the genus of this organism and uh, monocytogenous is a species of this organism. Therefore, just out of curiosity also, I wanted to do the phylogenetic analysis, although I knew what species it is. And in during the phylogenetic analysis, I obtained the same information that I knew already, that it is a Listeria genus, it's a, a monocytogenous species, and it was closely belonging to this half A serotype for EGDE, which I mentioned before, like EGDE is a half A serotype, and Scott A was a 4B serotype, and in the phylogenetic analysis, it was exactly clustering to that uh, to those two serotypes. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, and the second question was, is the organism present already in the gut flora? Uh, yes, it is It is actually present in the gut flora. So on an, in another independent study I was doing here, there I was doing some multi-omic data analysis for meta-gut bacteria, that is like meta-gut uh, samples, where we had like close to, I guess, 60 different bacteria that was present in the gut microbiota. And we were trying to sequence and do some proteogenomic analysis also in there. And we could clearly see that even for patients who have some other conditions, not only listeriosis, but some other conditions, then listeria is usually present in your gut bacteria. So under normal conditions, that is, if you're a healthy person, it is actually a beneficial bacteria also. But when you are like, uh, when actually, if you eat only contaminated food, which contains these particular listeria strains, then it causes this listeriosis. Otherwise, it's a beneficial bacteria and therefore is also present in the normal gut micro, uh, flora here. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I, I hope again that answers the yeah. second question. The third question is, can you explain about the comparison or what you mean transcript versus protein level expression? Uh, yeah, so by transcript and protein level expression difference, what I mean here. So we had at the protein level, I kind of showed you how we did the protein quantitative expression analysis, where we, you usually do a mass spectrometry analysis and you identify the protein quantities based upon its mass spectrum, where you calculate the area under the curve of e each of these spectral counts, and then you uh, try to see how much is the protein, and then you evaluate the protein quantity. Whereas for the transcript level expression, I did an RNA-seq analysis, and so extracting the RNAs and then doing an uh, Illumina-based analysis for these reads. And there, for the expression, what I mean is the number of reads that is mapping to each gene or a transcript of your organism. So depending upon the depth, the total number of reads, after, of course, some normalization, some statistical analysis where you try to uh, eliminate the technical and biological uh, artifact, then you uh, count the total uh, number of transcript reads that are mapping to your gene. In the case of flagella, so that was one kind of transcript analysis. And in the case of uh, flagella, we also did like a qPCR, quantitative PCR analysis. And there, uh, together in both RNA-seq, we observed that between the different conditions, total number of reads mapping to the flagellin transcript was almost constant. 
Whereas for the protein level, when you calculate this area under the curve, we saw that uh, the protein, uh, the total protein content was increasing between 0 to 15 to 30 minutes. Um, yeah, uh, I that's guess a yeah, that's the question. Right? Uh, so the next uh, the question four is, what yeah. is the inference you got from the transcripts that were missed in your proteomic results? Uh, yes, so very good question, actually, this one. So what we actually obtained is that I quickly showed you in, in one slide that we were in the difference between transcriptomics and proteomics. Let me restart. So what happens is proteomics is a very stochastic process. That is, a lot of proteins can be missed just because uh, your protein processing, how you extract the proteins, how you do a mass spectrometry is not ideal for this uh, particular analysis. Uh, you usually miss, for example, low abundant proteins, proteins that are very low expressed, proteins that are usually located on the transmembrane, or proteins that are uh, usually basic proteins, that is not acidic, but the basic proteins. And uh, you have also some proteins that are, let's say, like, uh, like hemagglutinins, which are like uh, highly, uh, very long proteins that are present in repetitive regions of a genome. You usually miss such kind of uh, proteins in your, uh, in your analysis. Whereas for the transcripts, you do not have such pro such transcripts or such uh, transcripts that are leading to these proteins are usually not missed. What we exactly observed was two things. One, the proteins that we are missing in the proteomic sample, we could recover them at the transcript level. But just by the transcript level differential expression, we did not want to comment too much on it because our aim was to prove that proteomics was actually quite interesting and also gives you an ultimate uh, difference between the function, uh, between its expression and then which can be related to the function. But at the transcript, we did observe these missing proteins. And of course, we had some other proteins that were actually differentially expressed at the transcript level, but the protein was not differentially expressed. That is, at the protein level, they were not functional. Now the question is, so what is happening? So what's what's at the transcript level? They are differentially expressed. So what's the post-transcriptional regulation why the protein is actually not uh, expressed in those conditions? So uh, we were particularly interested in the differential proteins versus differential transcript. And of course, this information is also available out there uh, for the people to explore and see that maybe they want to see which, if, the, if at the transcript level, they are differentially expressed, but not at the proteins, what is it happening? We did not explore in this particular case. Okay, uh, and the next question is, uh, have you considered the impact of microbiome on the pathogenicity of listeria? Uh, I don't think I do understand this question very clearly. Impact of microbiome. Like microbiome, maybe the, the user who asked me this question is impacting on the microbiome that is what are the other bacteria that are actually present in the gut along with listeria? If that, if the, if the question is uh, aimed at that direction, then I would have to say, no, we did not explore it. Although one part of my study I was actually doing on this listeria was biofilm formation. And biofilm formation is usually uh, associated with all the bacteria that is present in the system, that is uh, like in the gut microflora, for example. And together, they form this kind of matrix-like structures that are leading to biofilms. And therefore, bacteria under this biofilm condition can survive much better than if it's like existing by itself. But uh, we did not explore actually in this direction. And if I understand this question correctly, of course, there is a topic of interest that how listeria under the biofilm condition, along with different other microflora, is in fact uh, is having a pathogenicity effect. Um, yeah. Is, uh, can I still go on? Is, is yeah. So, so uh, Aditi, uh, you can stop us any time. Like uh, you almost took seven questions. So, if you have no issue, you can take three more questions. Otherwise, we can. Uh, okay. So, uh, is it okay for you to take yes. three more questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I, okay. Yeah. So. Yes. So, uh, yeah, the next question is, was any RNA-seq performed in your Listeria project? If so, was there any correlation between the transcriptome and proteome abundances across proteins in your Listeria project? Uh, yes, I think I mentioned this answer to this question. Yes, RNA-seq was done. 
in this project. This particular information is not yet released because ongoing, there's ongoing work on it. But there is this uh, website also which only focuses on listeria-based uh, biology, list different listeria strains. It's also from the Institute of Pasteur uh, from uh, France, from Paris. There you can find uh, all the RNA-seq data, not for these two strains, but also for other listeria strains. Um, so yeah, uh, I think then the other, other answers to the other question, I think it's already uh, there. Okay, okay. So, so thanks for answering all the question very patiently. So now I would request to ask Dr. Sandil sir to give a vote up with his questions. So I'll just give us some questions. Yeah, hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Mr. Sandil, uh, RT is a very nice presentation. Uh, I can uh, see you for a long time when the first set of bioinformaticians, uh, when you when we established the genomics and proteomics lab with Ravindran, you you people really helped us. And uh, really, you are, you are climbed the ladder at a very high level now. You are, uh, your information, your research work, you are bringing back and uh, educating our uh, students. It is really very nice. I'm really thank uh, for your nice presentation of the last uh, one hour. Okay, so the 